and ladies, ladies and gents, I need all of you to pay attention. If you have a mortgage and you are about to face foreclosure, you need to pay attention to this. There are a couple of things that I'm going to show you. Many of you did not know this. Some of you had an idea, but you actually never really saw it in print or saw it as many times as I'm about to show you. The first thing I want to show you is this case right here. Now, this is Johnson versus Gala. Okay, this is a New York case out of the Southern District of New York, 2007, before the crisis, at the very beginning of the crisis, by the way. I want you to pay attention. At oral argument, the plaintiffs conceded that they were informed of the mortgage amount of 246050 the court grants both these motions and dismisses the Home Ownership Equity Protection Act claim with respects to all of the defendants. H-O-E-P-A, uh, Home Ownership Equity Protection Act, Title 15, Section 1602, 1639 is part of the T-I-L-A, -T Truth in Lending Act. Just in case some of you didn't know, because I know most of you guys are not, there are a lot of acronyms out there. Alphabet suit. And as such, is barred by the same statute of limitations discussed in the above with respects to the Truth and Lending Act claim. Secondly, a Home Equity Protection Act loan is defined under Title 15 as a mortgage that a consumer's credit transaction, it's based on your credit transaction, pay attention, that is secured by the consumer's principal dwelling other than the residential mortgage transaction or reverse mortgage transaction. Got it? Now that's one of them credit lines, them line of credits, them equity line of credit. That's what they're talking about. Let's continue. The goal of the statute is to prevent predatory lending practices with respects to second and subordinate, sorry. It's my voice recognition. I got to shut it off or it's going to cause some problems. So I apologize for that. Okay. Is to prevent predatory lending. This was 2007, ladies and gentlemen. Is to prevent predatory lending. This is 2007, everyone, is to prevent predatory lending. This was done 2007, everyone. Remember the mortgage crisis of 2008? Was all about predatory lending? So when you all heard that it was something new and they didn't know about it and they were unaware, please understand how much of a lie that was. That's the first thing. Hold on. We got more that we're going to let you know about how they do things. Let's get rid of you. Okay. In this case, as alleged in the complaint, now we're going to find out there's some clear clarity right here. The loan is clearly a purchase money mortgage loan and not a second loan or a refinancing. Based on the allegations of the pleading, the loan extended by Greenpoint to Mary Johnson is not a loan covered under the Home Owners Equity Protection Act. Therefore, all claims for relief under the HOPA must be dismissed with respect to all defendants. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we do have to get some clarity here because they were wanting to make sure that it was clearly a... Now, I want you to pay attention to this. I want you all to pay attention to this statement right here. It says it's a purchase money mortgage loan. Now let's let's do a Google search on purchase money mortgage loan. Forget I was gonna put it in this window and do it under the case law, but I'd rather find out what's the general consensus of a purchase money mortgage loan. Sorry, I wasn't trying to do that and I don't know why it did that. See, it's still doing it. And I didn't click anything. Cancel. Let's see if I can get us back to where we were. All right. We're going to do the right click. This I did it again and it didn't, it didn't help me. All right. 
we're going to do the right click this time and we're going to look for this particular case i'm using firefox i don't normally use firefox and so firefox is not being kind to me today and i apologize to you all for that we're going to bring it up to yeah we'll bring it up to here so you guys can see it i don't have to enhance the screen a purchase money mortgage or seller owner finance pay attention seller owner finance this is important is a loan given to a buyer from the property seller it's common in situation where the buyer doesn't qualify for standard bank financing as the bank the seller sets down payment interest rates and closing purchase fees look at that it's just jumping all over the place without me doing anything and my microphone is turned off so don't know what that is google i i, I didn't say it okay a purchase money look at did it again let's do that one more again don't want the top one we want this one right here a purchase money mortgage is a mortgage issued by a borrower issued to a borrower by a seller of a home as part of a purchase transaction ladies and gentlemen when you buy a home and i'm gonna show it to you in a second so just be be patient when you buy a home you go to the bank and the bank says hey how you doing john um we're gonna run your credit and then we're gonna do a background check and everything and we're gonna see how much you qualify for okay so give us a moment hey john good news uh we've gone through all your paperwork your work history you got your bank statements you remember all that paperwork you sent them to us well that was to see if you qualified for a loan <laughs> look at this you qualified john yes you've been approved how much three hundred thousand dollars really oh john a hey, it's not us it's you it's your credit worthiness that allowed you to get a approval for a loan of three hundred thousand dollars now go ahead and get yourself a home now john not over three hundred thousand nope just go get yourself a home hey john you got that home Ooh, doggy ladies and gentlemen i'm not doing anything so you see how the screen is jumping that's not me i think what's happening and let me give me one quick second i'm a pause y'all for a second i think i know what's happening one second ladies and gentlemen i figured out what the problem was it was the voice recognition software it was actually running in the background and another program that i have opened up even though i shut it off here because of the way i shut it off i didn't shut it off completely so i did shut it off completely but then i said okay let me look up the other things i said i was going to look up while i'm talking to these people this whole thing about a purchase money mortgage. I was interested in that because that's exactly what's happening with each of you when you get this loan from the bank. You're purchasing money for a home, but you're not purchasing a home with money. Do you understand? That doesn't happen until the second transaction. The first transaction, you go to the bank and they approve you for the loan. Second transaction, you go to the homeowner and you purchase the loan for him, and then you guys get this thing known as escrow. When you put it in escrow, you're gonna find out in a second. When you put the property in escrow, the bank acts as a middleman. They pay the other party through escrow. That's where the trustee gets involved, which is usually a bank or a servicer, and they do the assignment. That's where the trustee gets involved because he's a trustee for an escrow. We'll show you that in a minute. Okay, seeing that that is the case, many people are not getting it, that they claim it's not a real trust agreement. Now, we're going to disprove that on so many levels, but they say that a trust agreement in the form of a deed of trust is not a trust agreement in the conventional sense. Their words, not mine. Hold on, we got to talk now. Don't be going nowhere. You know this Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act or... RISPA? I'm sorry. Let's see if we can see what RISPA has to say. Because the plaintiff had secured interest and equity in said real property by virtue of the plaintiff's down payment of $26,000 made to and acknowledged by Charles C. Scala, 
by letter dated February 8, 2003. And given the fact that Charles C. Scala, the seller, failed to disclose the down payment to the lender, prevented the lender, meaning he violated escrow, from collecting and holding said down payment and escrow funds in an amount sufficient to permit the lender to apply an escrow fund at the same specified time specified under the Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act. Now, yeah, so they're saying that the seller violated RISPA. Not concerned about the seller and RISPA. This is what we're concerned about, ladies and gentlemen. As I told you, it's the escrow that's doing all the harm to you. They're operating out of escrow. Everything is happening out of escrow. You don't believe me? That's why in the 1980s, California made it official state law for properties to go in escrow. That's where the sleight of hand is happening. So let's talk for a second, shall we? We're going to do this section right here, and then we're going we're gonna to go on to something else because i got other things I need to show you. The plaintiff's cause of action under RISPA is alleged only because Charles C. Scala, and as such, must be dismissed as to the remaining defendants. Well, basically, they blamed it on him and didn't blame it on the banks. Additionally, no cause of action can be sustained against the defendants under RISPA. There are only three private cause of actions that can be raised under RISPA. These actions arise under sections 2605, 2607, 2608. For violations of 2607, 2608, there is only one statute of limitations that has been exceeded in this case. Under 2607, Title 12, concerns the prohibition against kickbacks and unearned fees. Section 12, I mean, Title 12, Section 2608, the liability of the seller with respect to recurring or requiring title insurance may be purchased from any particular title insurance company. Regardless of the year of the statute of limitations of this action, plaintiffs have not alleged facts sufficient to sustain a cause of action. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we're showing you this is because you need to see. We're going to go back one so you can see that this is the loan from the bank did not constitute a mortgage but a personal loan and that was the comment that we were putting in here okay we didn't get our exact quote i will refine it later what i need to do hold on got to get rid of that we're going to go here the matter of the bank of new york Y'all know why we're mattering with the Bank of New York? Watch this. Another question has to do with the Series G bonds. Petitioner wants to know whether there should be value on the quarterly valuation dates on the basis of their then redemption value if turned into, uh, excuse me, if turned in for redemption or on the basis of costs, which under the petitioner's practice is par. Ladies and gentlemen, what the Bank of New York was doing is the same thing we are doing. Well, technically, we're doing the same thing they did as an organization. Individuals receive a bond known as a SAP pack, and then there is a redemption period. Pay attention. Five years is the standard redemption period. That's why most people have been, well, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? We've explained it and explained it and explained it, and people are not getting it. After that redemption period, then they can come and redeem it. And the value they redeem it for is the par value, according to the agreement, in tax credits. Okay? The petitioner elected to carry the bonds at cost and has used that figure in the valuation required by the statute. Petitioner justifies that method of treating the bonds on the basis of their intrinsic worth, which is what we do, and on the fact that they cannot be bought or sold in the general market and are redeemable only by, now, their bonds are redeemable by the government. Ours are redeemable only by the government as well because they are tax credits. These factors are urged as justifications to treat such bonds at their par worth. The court finds no reason to question 
the procedures of the petitioner. If it directed the petitioners to carry the bonds at redemption values, it would in effect give a bonus to new participants in the fund since these bonds would then be bonds to raise value if held to maturity. Like I said, we're just doing what everyone else is doing. If the court directed the redemption value to be used, it would compel the withdrawing participants to take a discount value for its units through the fact no actual redemption of the bonds had occurred. Again, catch 22. We'll continue to comply with the law and we'll continue to do what we're required to do to satisfy our obligations to all of our clients. That's why we had to secure the credits first before anyone got any redemption. So very shortly before the end of the year as promised, we're working on it now, we're training the staff now, and you guys are gonna have to be patient with me. Now, I just wanted to show you that real quick. What I want you guys to understand is this. I'm gonna go to this document. Haven't titled it yet? Well, we titled it, just haven't completed it yet. The next thing I have to do is the loan from the bank constitutes a personal loan and not a home mortgage. I have to complete that case law. Right now, we're gonna complete this case law. The financial institutions have committed fraud against the American people. The similarities between the trustee of an express trust and a trustee under a deed of trust end with the name. What's in the name, y'all? Although the trust agreement has a grantor beneficiary and a trustee, the duties of the trustee are those of what an actual trustee would be in a trust. It says they're not those. That's what they're saying. The duties of the trustee are those of what an actual trustee would be in a trust. It's letting us know they're not the same. It appears that this is the intentional deception on the part of the financial institutions for they have at no time explained to the borrower, this is me writing this, that the deed of trust is neither a trust agreement under the common understanding, nor is it evidence of a secured loan. Now, let's continue here so we make sure of what I just said. A deed of trust is an encumbrance on real property akin to a mortgage. It is not a sale. Black's Law Dictionary explains that a deed of trust resembles a mortgage. Okay, the deed of trust is not such a transaction. It's not a mortgage transaction. Further, the claim to the deed of trust signed by the commissioner is invalid because it failed to take an oath as required by the statute, said he wasn't required. The trustee under a deed of trust is not a trustee that owes a fiduciary obligation to the trustee, I mean, to the trustor, to the grantor. As noted above, a mortgage or loan contract does not by its nature satisfy the precautionary. <laughs> yeah, I'm not the word, uh -uh, non precautionary interest. Hate these words that they just make up. Ladies and gentlemen, general matter, the holder of the trust deed is not a fiduciary, does, has no fiduciary duty to the trustor. The holder of the note. They claim that the holder of the note doesn't owe you nothing. Okay, now we need to go ahead and pay attention. Now, they say that the courts have definitely let us know that a deed of trust is just like a panda. You see, a panda is not a true bear. So a trustee and a deed of trust is not a true trustee. A panda is not a true bear. Who would have said a panda was a bear? Oh, it's called a panda bear. Who would have said a panda was a bear? What does a panda have to do with this? Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the phrase, if it walks like, talks like, acts like, it is. So let me give you the scenario. And this is true in law as well. Ladies and gentlemen, deed of trust has a grantor, right? And the deed of trust has a beneficiary. Right? And the deed of trust has a trustee who owes a fiduciary duty to the beneficiary. Go back and look at the deed of trust. That's why he secures the property on behalf of the beneficiary. They're saying, uh-uh, mm-mm, 
foreclosure pursuant to a deed of trust does not constitute a debt collection on the FD, uh, uh, FDCPA. Wait, hold on. The law is clear that foreclosure on a deed of trust does not invoke the statutory protections of the RFDCPA. Really? We got to talk, ladies and gentlemen, because you guys really got to understand what's going on here. Every time somebody came up with an argument to get their house back, they came up with an argument to defeat them getting their house back. These arguments are presumption. These are not laws, people. Court opinions are presumptions. They are not law. It is the Supreme Court who comes to facts and conclusions of law. When you have a decision made by one body, that decision is made by that one body. It's not made by, and when I mean by one body, I mean one judge. That is not the decision of the entire circuit, not the decision of the entire United States judicial branch. That is the opinion of a judge. But it's a presumptive opinion. I spoke to somebody today who told me he had a case and how they were doing them wrong. And I told him, and I said, and the first thing you did is you went in there trying to tell them how and what they were not going to do and what they were going to do. And I said, and they explained to you how none of that was going to work, right? And he told me they sent him for a psyche valve. And they violated his rights. And I tried to get him to understand they didn't violate your rights. Everything they did was based upon your actions. I'm not saying they were right, but it was based upon your actions. Everything you did, they could say, well, because he did this and did that, we had some questions. Really? Because he did that and did that. Really? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, be it said, y'all need to understand. Y'all are messing with an arena that it's not an arena where they are purposely ignoring your rights okay what happens is the purpose act was done years ago by other judges these judges are just following what the norm is they're, they're doing what they're told to do as an organization they have meetings they have seminars and everything they're doing what they're told to do now now we get to discuss some things you guys ready because there is one case i have to put in here because i have to find out what it says and then I have to get off of here because I have a meeting tonight. A deed of trust cannot exist in a vacuum. A deed of trust cannot exist in a vacuum. You mean I can't put my deed of trust in my vacuum cleaner? Oh, God. Why, why, then why, why would I, why I need a vacuum cleaner if I can't put my deed of trust in there? Ain't that the only reason why you use a vacuum cleaner is to put your deed of trust? Because a deed of trust, it can't, ex oh, it can't exist in a vacuum. So that's why you don't need a vacuum. Anyway, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Once the underlying obligation is satisfied, the deed of trust is automatically extinguished by operation of law. Isn't that how a trust agreement works? Once all the obligations are satisfied, doesn't the trust agreement cease to exist? Interesting. A security interest cannot exist without an underlying obligation. Okay, so we're going to talk. Y'all need to stay with me. For the reasons stated elsewhere... We conclude that Viagra, I'm sorry, Vergara has not pled any actionable irregularities in the cell. Further, Malmet, although normally a trustee, was not the trustee with fiduciary duties to Viagra. Just as a panda is not an ordinary bear, a trustee, oh God, of a deed of trust? <laughs> preposterous. He's not an ordinary trustee. Yeah, right. Let's continue. The duties of a trustee under a deed of trust are strictly limited and defined by the contract of the parties and the statutes. Ladies and gentlemen, actually not. It's defined by the contract, unless the contract it says that it's done under the laws of the state, which they do but it's defined by the contract. That contract that you sign, that's written by you. Hold on. Y'all, you do know that the grantor writes the deed of trust. Go back and look. The grantor is the one who commissions the deed of trust. It is well established. We'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. 
however, that a trustee under a deed of trust is not a trustee in a typical sense. Rather, he's an agent for all of the parties. Pay attention. Because this we're going to use. Rather, he is an agent for all of the parties to the escrow at all times prior to the performance of the conditions of the escrow and bears a fiduciary relationship to each of them. Pay attention. And bears a fiduciary relationship to each of them. But didn't they just tell us that a trustee doesn't bear a fiduciary relationship to nobody? Didn't they just say that he's not a trustee in a traditional sense? Like a panda is not a bear and a bear is not a panda? Didn't they just say that? So how can... And look, he's a bear now. That bear, that bear mother... Okay, he's a bear now, but he wasn't a bear up there, but he's a bear. See, a panda is not an ordinary bear, but he's a he's a bear right down here. How can he not be a bear up here and be a bear down here? Pay attention. 1971. So how did things change from him having a fiduciary relationship to not having a fiduciary relationship? What happened, ladies and gentlemen? They got technical. They started using presumptions with you people, telling you need to rebut their junk. Well, guess what we're doing right here? We're rebutting their junk. Okay? Watch this. TikTok copy, because we want more cases like that. That says exactly that. Land title also argues that it has long been held that a trustee under a deed of trust does not owe a fiduciary obligation. Hold on. What, what year is this? 2012. So from 2071 to 2007 and 2012, a trustee doesn't owe a fiduciary relationship. But he did back then, but he doesn't now. What change? Now, the lender holds the indebtedness and is the beneficiary the deed of trust so there is a debt the lender holds the indebtedness because they say it's not a debt under the fdcpa so we're gonna do that one too do you find oh i'm sorry ladies and gentlemen i don't think that i've explained oh i did the federal reserve notes are not redeemable in any commodity we're gonna we're gonna go back to that later okay where they tell you that Federal Reserve notes have no value, and then all of a sudden people have used that in their cases, and the courts have said they argue this, they argue that. I'm sorry, I'm not arguing nothing. So since you want to sit up there and go contrary to what the Treasury has said, I have the right to call the Treasury here personally to testify, since you're contradicting the United States Treasury, which you don't have that right, since they've been given authority under the law. You guys do know that the Treasury has the right to make laws concerning finances, financial institutions. That's right. Proclamation 2039. One second. This is going to be a lot to put in there because it ain't going to like the fact that I put all that in there. But I need to, I'm fishing. So let's see what we can find. See, my query is too long. My query is too long. Uh, all the other time, my query is too short. You need to lit and lengthen it, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back because I, I have to find these to show it to you. I don't want to take you guys through the whole rabbit hole with me because you ain't got no business in no rabbit holes. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, you will learn something today because I have a question stating that a trustee is an agent of all the parties to the escrow. And bears a fiduciary relationship to them. Okay, we just read that, right? Hold on. Is he just a party to the escrow? A trustee is an agent for all the parties, or for both parties of the deed of trust, of the deed of trust, not the escrow, because the deed of trust does not exist in escrow. Go back and look. The deed of trust is not created during escrow. Well, technically, it's created during escrow, but it's not created causing escrow. It's created during escrow. Go ahead. However, the trustee is an agent of both parties to the deed of trust and occupies a fiduciary relationship as to both. In the event that the mortgage is not present, the trustee should accept mortgagee's bid 
as a specific blah, blah, blah. Okay, hold on. The trustee to a deed of trust is an agent of both parties and he therefore occupies a fiduciary relationship between the parties. Hold on. Lee versus Lee, Mississippi. Mississippi, another Mississippi case saying the same thing. Let's see if we can find another case besides Mississippi saying the same thing. An escrow holder occupies a fiduciary. Well, we don't want to know about an escrow holder, Washington. What, what's wrong with y'all? This court long has recognized that a trustee of a deed of trust stands as a fiduciary relationship in both with both the debtor and the creditor. Wait, hold on a minute. Hold, hold on, hold on. They said that it ain't a debt. Didn't we just read that it is not a debt under the FDCPA? But here they say it has a fiduciary relationship between the debtor and the creditor. And pay attention. This court long has recognized that a trustee to a deed of trust. So this was 2012. But wait a minute. I could have sworn. Hold on. Hold on. Because that says it's been a long time. It's been a long time. I shouldn't have left you. The lender holds an indebtedness and the beneficiary and is the beneficiary of the deed of trust. So it is a debt. Under the deed of trust, the trustee's duties are limited to upon default undertaking foreclosure and upon satisfaction of the deed of trust, reconveying the deed of trust. They say that's all the trustee gets to do. Actually, no. The trustee has a job to assure that the lender and the borrower, creditor and debtor, creditor and debtor, he has the job of communicating, being the intermediary between the two. That's what his job is. But we're going to highlight this second uh, section, that a trustee under deed of trust is not a trustee in a technical sense. Rather, he is an agent for all the parties to the escrow. So this one says agent to the parties. So we're going to go a couple of months up, a couple of case laws up, 2007. A deed of trust cannot exist in a vacuum. Under the underlying obligation, is satisfied the deed of trust. No, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this one, I believe. Oh, yes, yeah, similarity between a trustee of an express trust and a trustee under a deed of trust end with the name. A trustee under express trust must consent to serve as trustee, must not use or deal with the trust property for the trustee. It's a trust. That's the tr that's an express trust. Let's find out. Now they claim that an express trust and a deed of trust are not the same thing. So what are the other types of trust are there? So why can't he be a trustee in no sense? The law is clear that foreclosure on a deed of trust does not invoke a statutory protections of the FDCPA because it is not a debt. The foreclosure pursuant to the deed of trust does not constitute a debt collection under the FDCPA. This was 2010. We just read that that is a lie. We just read that the court has long recognized the trustee to a deed of trust stands as a fiduciary relationship between the debtor and the creditor. We just learned that. Hold on. No, this is escrow again. No, we don't want the escrow. Don't want escrow? Don't want escrow. The trustee to a deed of trust is an agent for both parties and therefore occupies a fiduciary relationship between the parties. But they just said that a trustee is not exactly what is being said he is. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What am I doing? I want to do this right here. Copy, copy, copy. And I want to do this right here. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm doing, and now I'm going to give you the... There, Michael Jackson and his brothers sang a song I think Michael Jackson was in that in that song in 2300 Jackson Street. They sang a song, and it was entitled Art to All This Madness, or Art to the Madness. And the song was entitled such because that is a phrase that is a phrase that's been going on for centuries. There's an art to the madness. So, ladies and gentlemen, there's an art to what I'm doing, what I am putting together here. The courts are saying one thing, and at the very same time, in a different court, in the very same part of the United States, saying something else. 
but each court is saying something as if it is a fact. All it is is a presumption. The facts are documented by the Supreme Court. That's why Supreme Court precedent is the star deceases, the law that the courts must follow. Okay, everybody, well, the judge said this, F the judge. The judge just gave his opinion. And you people who rely on an opinion of a judge without appealing that and documenting what that idiot said being wrong, shame on you. I apologize. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a very stressful day. And because it's been so stressful, I'm not going to be doing this video much longer because I got a meeting that will be happening in less than, look at that, 30 minutes. So I'm not going to let y'all stress me out. Oh, wow, wait on that meeting. There is no way on this planet I'm going to let y'all do that to me. Okay. So. What I'm trying to tell you guys, I, I need to let you know what's going on because you you probably, some of you probably have figured it out, but many of you have not. And shame on you if you have not. Ladies and gentlemen, I gave you my word that I would do what I can to help you. Let me uh, close this curtain so that the wind is not blowing on the microphone because I do know how that noise is bothersome to some of you. And I don't care. Okay. Anyway, I told you that I would do what I can to help. Uh-oh, that's right. I didn't copy the whole thing. Well, you know what? Forget that. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take all of those case laws that I just did right here, and we're going to put them here. We'll put this online. It'll be its own folder. We'll do another video in the future letting you guys know about the folder, where we're putting it at. The reason why we're doing this, ladies and gentlemen, is because we're going to create just that thing, your complaint. They want to do a non-judicial foreclosure? By, by all means, you're going to follow the law. Okay? What do you mean you're going to follow, you're going to follow the law? The law says that in a non-judicial foreclosure, there are certain things you get to demand. And one of them is the qualified written request as to certain things. Okay, we're going to cover RISPA because that's where qualified written requests come from. We're going to cover the Graham Leach Bailey Act. You don't know about the Graham Leach Bailey Act. My mama know about the Graham Leach Bailey Act. Y'all should know about the Graham Leach Bailey Act because Graham and Leach and Bailey, them individuals thought they were somebody. They weren't nobody though, but they thought they were somebody. And, you know, as long as you think you're somebody, when you're nobody, you still ain't nobody. You know what I'm saying? Nobody knows the trouble I see. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I stated, the reason why we're putting this information here is because we're getting ready to make a complaint form that is specific. Specific. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Spe sp specific and it is specific to mortgages that will be and it won't look like the other one although we're starting out with the same design because it already has no not that design get out of here we're not going to do the flag and all that it's going to be completely different we're starting off with the same platform but a lot of this will be changed and rearranged and moved around you know what i'm saying and we're going to have fewer questions, but we're going to be dealing with fewer points, bringing up the fact that how the courts are contrary to themselves, how you are relying on this, how you are relying on that. You know what? I just realized that right here, we're missing the part about the additional party. Oh, because this is not the same one that you guys got. This is a different one. So let me trash. No. Yeah, let me trash that. Get on out of here. Go on. Get, 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 get back in the trash. Okay. You're going to have the part for the securitization trustee. Remember, they are trading your property on the market. It is your property. We have tons of case law showing you're the owner of that property when you have a deed of trust. But what gives them the right to trade that deed of trust on the market and benefit from it and you not benefit? They're collecting interest on that trade. They're receiving dividends. So how come you're not getting paid? Don't worry about it. We know that they're supposed to tell you. We know that the middleman and the securitization trustee is supposed to inform you. We don't care about that right now. 
That's not our concern. What we are concerned about is you haven't received a dime. And yet they're saying that you have failed to pay. So you're going to say they failed to pay you. So you guys, I will get it done. Y'all just going to have to bear with me because the judicial complaint was more important than the mortgage one. Why? Because if we don't start correcting the judges, they're going to keep doing exactly what you just saw me show you them do. Contradicting themselves, changing the rules, changing the rules, changing the rules. Every time you have a victory, every time you are successful, wait, we got one more. Sorry, I got one more thing I want to show y'all. So y'all just going to bear with me just for a second, okay? Because I'm going to pause y'all. Like I said, I got that meeting and I'm going to give myself 20 minutes before it starts. So one second. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I knew that this case was actually real. The only problem is I thought it was unpublished. This is not an unpublished case. This is actually published. This is done by the Court of Appeals of, uh, it says New York Superior Court, but eventually it went to the Appeals Court. And in the Appeals Court, let's go up here to the top to make sure that Peabody, no, the Supreme Court for the state of New York, which is technically an Appeals Court in New York. But anyway, the Supreme Court made this decision in 2008 regarding, believe, Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank. Y'all yeah, remember Deutsche? But everybody took this quote right here from this case as if this was a statement by the judge. This is not a statement by the judge. He's just saying what the defendant was personally served with process on July 25th, 2007, and in her answer to the complaint, she then, self-represented, did not deny the complaint's material allegations, yet asserted as a defense that Equifast, Equifirst, when making the loan, violated Regulation Z of the Truth and Lending Act. And that the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, excuse me, and that Equi first failed to properly credit and apply payments she made and intentionally created fraud in the factum. These are statements and conclusions. And withheld from the plaintiff vital information concerning said debt and all the matrix involving the loan. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why that cannot be used as a quote unless you're going to go to the actual act and quote it. It's not the quote of the court. It's the quote of a party. We're going to party. Okay. It says right here, the court reviewed the record on appeal. Again, here, the plaintiff offers no evidence that it took physical delivery of the note. Because they had no standing, their case was dismissed. Because the defendant, their argument about MERS and blah, 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 uh-uh. But they did grant the cross motion without cost and then dismissed it without cost. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a practice of the court. To grant your motion for waiver of fees and then to dismiss it right after granting it. That's illegal. Because to grant your motion for farmer paupers, and then not give you the opportunity of perfecting your case because to grant a motion for former properties means that you have stated a value, valid claim. That is one of the considerations in granting a motion for former properties. Okay, so by accepting and dismissing it, y'all need to be appealing that junk. The plaintiff's motion seeking summary judgment is denied as moot. Okay, the defendant actually one without winning this memorandum shall constitute a decision in order of this court okay now let's see what's the first point that they made here because i didn't read all the way through because it was just so intoxicatingly long ladies and gentlemen i gotta go uh we're gonna continue this in another video but right now thank you for paying attention gotta